Hi everybody, it's Adam with ArcValveSurgery.com and this is a special cardiologist question and answer session all about transcatheter mitral valve therapy. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Howard Herman, who's the director for interventional cardiology at Penn Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. During his extraordinary career, Dr. Herman has been performing transcatheter mitral valve therapies for over 20 years. Dr. Herman, it is great to see you again and thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here with you as well. Yeah, Dr. Herman, to get started, can you help the patients out there understand what is an interventional cardiologist? An interventional cardiologist like myself is someone who does procedures in the heart. Some of those are diagnostic procedures, cardiac catheterizations to figure out what's wrong, either in the arteries or the chambers of the heart, and therapeutic procedures where we fix things. When I started my career, that involved primarily balloon angioplasty, but over time that's evolved to stenting, peripheral vascular procedures, and the area of my main interest, which is structural and valvular heart disease, so that now we're able to repair and replace heart valves. Dr. Herman, that is fascinating. Can you talk about the evolution of how you're using catheters to treat valvular disease and perhaps what are some of the benefits for patients? The field of using catheters to fix heart disease and particularly valve disease really began in the 1980s um, with the use of large balloons to open up stuck valves in the pulmonic, mitral, and eventually the aortic position. And this was blowing up a balloon placed through a catheter in the groin. So we didn't have to do open heart surgery. We didn't have to stop the heart. And in fact, most of the time, the patients were awake uh, under some form of conscious sedation. So the recovery was very quick. And we could blow up these balloons, split open the valves, and get some improvement for their symptoms. And that was where we were in the 1980s. Aortic balloon valvoplasty turned out to be not such a great procedure. It had transient benefit. And the field kind of stymied for a while until the development of things like MitraClip, which allowed us to start treating regurgitant or leaky heart valves, not stuck ones. And that began in the early 2000 period and has led the evolution to transcatheter valve replacement, where we actually put in an aortic, mitral, or pulmonic valve, and even tricuspid valves. Now, all four of the valves we can now replace through a catheter in the groin. Dr. Herman, let's dive a little deeper into the mitral clip, which is, as I understand, one of the first transcatheter mitral valve therapies to receive approval. When did it get an FDA indication and what has been the result for your patients? So mitral clip is a procedure where we put a clip on the two leaflets in the middle to create a dual orifice. So normally the mitral valve sort of opens and closes, but here we're putting a clip in the middle so that we end up with two openings. And the first ones of those procedures were done more than 20 years ago in 2003. The majority of these procedures are done through the femoral vein, threaded then up through the veins of the system into the heart. Sometimes we have to make a little hole in the heart chambers to get from one side to the other. But the point is that we don't have to stop the heart. So there's no heart lung bypass machine involved. There's no incision that has to heal. There's no dilution of the blood. And so the only thing the patient really knows about is the general anesthesia. They are put to sleep for these procedures. The procedures take anywhere from an hour and a half to two or three hours, depending on how complicated the procedure is and how, how much work has to be done. But the great majority of patients can go home the next day. The approval in 2013 demonstrated that this procedure was safer than surgery and the results were good enough for high-risk patients. And so that was the approval in 2013 for what's called primary mitral regurgitation. Dr. Herman, you just talked about primary regurgitation being treated with the mitral clip. I'm curious if you can distinguish what secondary mitral regurgitation is and what's being done to help patients maybe using transcatheter techniques. So as you alluded to, there are really two kinds of mitral regurgitation. Primary regurgitation refers to diseases that affect the leaflets, things like mitral valve prolapse. Secondary mitral regurgitation refers to the diseases that affect the ventricle, where the mitral leaflets attach. So if you've had a heart attack or a cardiomyopathy and your left ventricle is enlarged, it pulls on those leaflets, separates them, and makes it harder for them to get together and block a regurgitant flow. 
In 2019, an important trial was published called COAPT that demonstrated that patients who had secondary mitral regurgitation also benefited from the mitral club with less mortality and fewer heart failure hospitalizations over subsequent years. And importantly, Adam, we've gotten better and better at doing MitraClip. It's now called TEER. TEER stands for Transcatheter Edge-to-Edge Repair, T-E-E-R. Over the last 10 years, we've gotten bigger clips, longer clips, different kinds of clips. And so we're getting better and better at doing this. And there are new trials now looking at lower risk patients to see if we can duplicate the results that we saw in the high risk patients. Dr. Herman, great progress for primary and secondary mitral regurgitation. As you know, some patients may not have a valve that's repairable. I'm curious to know, are you working on anything for transcatheter mitral valve replacement? Yeah, that's a great question, Adam, as you're alluding to. Probably only a third of patients are perfect candidates for this transcatheter edge-to-edge repair. There are others that can be treated, but maybe the results won't be quite as good as in those perfect candidates. And then there are some patients who just can't be treated with edge-to-edge repair. They have calcified valves, the leak is too extensive to clip closed. And for those patients, a valve replacement is really the best option. And there are a number of devices, probably 30 some companies now developing various forms of catheter-based valve replacement. These are foldable devices, compressible devices, balloon expandable devices, self-expanding devices. Dr. Herman, given your incredible experience with transcatheter mitral valve techniques, what is your number one piece of advice for patients considering these procedures? The most important thing is to be at a, a center that has all of the options. There are just as many incredible advances happening in the surgical field, robotic surgery and minimally invasive techniques, and each patient's different. So you want to have the options all available to you and make an informed choice, not only on your own, but with your physicians about what's best for your specific mitral valve problem. That is great advice, Dr. Herman. And on behalf of all the patients at heartvalvesurgery.com, patients all over the world, I want to thank you for taking time away from your very busy practice at Penn Medicine and sharing all these great insights about the innovations for transcatheter mitral valve therapy. Well, thank you very much, Adam. And I'm happy to, always happy to educate your viewers and your patients. Hi everybody, it's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit heartvalvesurgery.com.